Okay, so I was floating around on the old YouTubes here and I saw this really interesting video uh, here. Galen Strawson on consciousness, free will, the self, and the meaning of life. That's a lot of topics. Um, it's on a very small channel, JP Andrew. It looks like James Andrew. Maybe he's a, um, maybe he's a, a, a postdoc or a lecturer. I don't know. Uh, he has a sub stack. If you go to the about down here, where does it say? Um, if you go here, you click JP Andrew, a philosophy PhD and lecturer. Uh, maintain blog newsletter, Substack profile, JP Andrew, and YouTube. Here we are. Okay, so this is the only video. So I don't know why this video is here. The sociological explanation. Huh? But there is, of course. <laughs> but I was uh, checking out a little bit. Oops. Um, anyway, so I don't really know why it's here or who this guy is, but uh, um, I know something about Strassen's views. I, he taught a class at the Graduate Center. He taught a couple of classes there before I, he left. Um, so I definitely had classes with him. <clears throat> I would email him and he would send me long quotes back as responses. <laughs> and I actually tried to get him on Consciousness Live a couple of times, but it hasn't worked out. So um, I think his views are interesting, although I also am somewhat frustrated by the way he approaches these things. So it'll be interesting to hear. I heard a little bit of this before I decided to go ahead and record it. They were talking about what he views, what he's, what he thinks of as philosophy, and he was using quotes a lot. Um, <laughs> so it checks out with my experience. Uh, but I think we're going to get the consciousness here soon. They were just about to say, "Let's transition to your work on consciousness." About consciousness. How did Wait. you start thinking about the hard problem of consciousness? Wait. Your work on. Con I like that. I, you know, I love the I love the seller's quit. Um, okay, so transitioning now to uh, to talk about your work on consciousness, uh, which which you're quite well known. By the way, this slow talk is not going to do it for me. Let's get up to speed. On there for at this point, how did you begin thinking about consciousness? How did you start thinking about the hard problem of consciousness and so forth? Um, well, I should think. Uh, I think everybody's bound to as soon as they start or very soon I'm, I'm, i certainly i'd always been a materialist in the sense in the philosophical sense that i have always thought that there was nothing supernatural um, and that everything in the universe was wholly physical uh, and so of course uh, it, i had the, the standard problem how could consciousness be physical uh, i was also pretty interested in psychoanalysis i read a lot of freud in my final year at university and and in the theory of evolution so i guess those things fed in but i hardly need explanation why one gets interested in the, in the so-called problem of consciousness because it seems it seems although i think it's wrong it seems like such a big problem <laughs> how yeah, could means... how could no, if you're a materialist if you're someone like me who thinks everything is physical how could consciousness possibly exist right right okay right and okay. so and that leads nicely into my next question so do you oh. think that the, could the existence of consciousness be sensibly denied <laughs> <laughs> now you're laughing because you i'm just setting you up so um, no. all right so for those who don't know strassen um has famously said is one of the silliest ideas in the world it's the you know the great silliness the illusionism in other words i remember just as an aside too when i was a student at the grad center and he came and he was talking about real materialism and like we gotta be and i was like finally I'm endorsing the reality of consciousness but being physicalist and i was like yes uh but then i read his book and took his class and i realized oh no he's a panpsychist but that's not so i i i find myself um not amused by the way in which many people just find it unintelligible that consciousness can be physical like anything else. Strassen tries to give an argument for that. So we'll see what his actual argument is. I think they're going to talk about it. This thing's an hour long. Holy moly. Okay. <laughs> um, can I say, is that it? Um, <laughs> and why, and why, why not? Why, why can't so you we probably need to ask me, what do I mean by consciousness? I suppose. Right. Um, yeah. Why not? Well, what I mean by it is what I think you mean by it, and which is what most people who are talking about it today mean by it, which is the what it's like of, of everyday experience, color experience, taste experience, smell experience, pain experience, but also, and I would add this, I would mark this out also, the, the kind of overall experience you and I are having right now in talking to each other, that is, it's not just colors and sounds, right? There's, there's experience of understanding. So I just mean everything it's like yeah, I agree with that, by the way, the experience of understanding cognitive phenomenology, the experience of thinking, 
the experience of remembering, of judging, willing, all these things I think are part of phenomenal consciousness. So I agree with this point. Um, definitely agree. For us to live, um, call it, you know, I don't, I don't know how to put it better than that. Um, in fact, I like the, I like, as you, the, as Ned Block says, lifting a quotation from Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong, when he was asked what jazz was, said, if you've got to ask, you ain't never going to know. Right. And I would say, if somebody comes along and asks me what consciousness is, I'm going to say the same thing. <laughs> Wait a minute. Was that his Louis Armstrong impression? He just did a different accent, right? Hold on. Did he just do a Louis Armstrong accent? Galen, did you literally just do a Louis Armstrong accent? <laughs> Hold on. It's colors and sounds, right? There's, there's experience of understanding. So I just mean everything it's like for us to live. Um, call it, you know, I, I don't know how to put it better than that. Um, in fact, I like the, I like, as you, the, as Ned Block says, lifting a quotation from Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong, when he was asked what jazz was, said, if you've got to ask, you ain't never going to know. Right. And I would say, if he totally did an accent. And I'm even doing this. Maybe it's because I'm doing it at a, let's hear it at normal speed. <laughs> this is hilarious. It's not just colors and sounds, right? There's, there's experience of understanding. So I just mean everything it's like for us to live. Um, call it, you know, I, I don't know how to put it better than that. Um, in fact, I like the, I like, as you, the, as Ned Block says, lifting a quotation from Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong, when he was asked what jazz was, said, if you've got to ask, you ain't never going to know. Right. And I would say, if somebody comes along and asks me what consciousness is, I'm going to say the same thing. If you Okay, so that's hilarious. But now to the main point. So first of all, some people think this is a really suspicious move to make right here. Um, the, if you got to ask, you ain't never going to know. So there are people who argue that making this move prohibits ever giving an intelligible explanation of consciousness. So if all you can say is... If you have to ask, you'll never know. When someone says, what's the definition of phenomenal consciousness? Then where do you go from there? <clears throat> it does seem like, well, you can't give an explanation of that. So, you know, how could you get into this then? Well, some philosophers think that what you need to do is separate the consciousness aspect from the conscious thing you're conscious of, like the mental quality. And then you can kind of try to give a separate account of each one of those aspects. This is like the central idea behind the higher order approach, you might think. Uh, you give a separate account for the mental qualities and then a separate different account for like how those things become conscious or are conscious or whatever. You may not like those accounts, but they're trying to uh, do this thing in a way that goes beyond simply saying, if you got to ask, you ain't never going to know. So things like, well, there's some kind of inner awareness, a, con a phenomenally conscious state is one that I'm aware of myself as being in. These are the sorts of things that some people think can move us past, say a little bit more than if you got to ask, you ain't never got to know, excuse me, whatever the quote is. Black doesn't really say that anymore. That's from an old paper, by the way. Um, But I take the idea, I do think that I share the sympathy with his frustration that oftentimes you get the feeling that people say, I don't know what you mean by phenomenal consciousness, and they really do. So <clears throat> I, I do share that sim sympathy with him. Okay, interesting. Let's go on, though. I'll ask you ain't never going to know. I think it's absurd. Okay, it's absurd so, given that, get, so given that, why did it become a common view among philosophers of mind and some scientists huh. in the 20th well, century just, that consciousness well, just... is an illusion, that it's not real? Um, right. Yeah, because Strassen has a whole view about what he calls the looking glassing of certain terms and how they became defined to be the inverse of what they really are or something like that. So I don't agree with any of that stuff, but he, the interviewer, is, as Strassen says, setting him up. Wait, you're triggering my next... Um... <laughs> Quotation here. I have to have. I have got this down on a piece of paper. Well, what can, I can give you a sociological explanation first. I'll give you very. So, which is, um, as Russell said, there are things that only philosophers with a long training in absurdity 
could succeed in believing. So <laughs> I'll say that first. Okay, so the Russell quote might actually have been aimed at his father. I wonder who Russell said that about, but, you know, Russell and, and the, the senior Strauss and PF had a her fluffle towards the end where they were calling each other senile and stuff and got pretty brutal in print. Uh, so, huh. You know, I don't think that's a charitable. This is my problem with illusionism is that you can take an uncharitable reading of what they're trying to say and use it as a way to dismiss what they're actually trying to argue. So then I wonder, like, how useful is this rhetoric that they are actually engaging in? And what I mean by that, you can see in the reaction that Strassen's having right here. So... What the illusionists are trying to do is to deny a certain conception of consciousness. It's bound up in this, they use this language with denying what is likeness or whatever. But I think it's unfair to say they deny consciousness. The battle is over whether this way of defining it or picking out the thing that we want to explain is the right one, given what our, our, our task is. So... It's very easy to paint the illusionists as though they're saying this ridiculous thing, but none of them really do, I feel like. And Strassen has never really, for whatever reason, moved past this initial knee-jerk reaction to illusionism. I mean, I think my position is you shouldn't talk that way because <laughs> this will happen and people will dismiss your view. So rhetorically... I think illusionists don't do themselves any favors by saying we deny that phenomenal consciousness exists. What they really think is that people think of phenomenal consciousness in the wrong way and that hampers the our theorizing and science of it. And that's a perfectly legitimate thing to think and argue about. So I would say. Um, and actually there's um there's a nice quotation I also like from Dan Daniel Kahneman. Um, and you know, this is based on, as it were, experimental work. He says, we know, I quote, we know that people can maintain an unshakable faith in any proposition, however absurd, when they are sustained by a community of like-minded believers. So that's, as it were, the sociological explanation. But there is, of course, there's a... Um, there... That's the soci... Do people not see that when they give these sociological explanations that they're just like projecting, it seems like, and that most people who don't agree with him are going to see that as like pointed right back at him. He does have a nice speaking voice, though I feel bad making him speak like a chipmunk. So let's let him. Uh, as it were, an explanation of how people came seriously to think this. And I guess it goes like this. Um, first of all, they're materialists like me. They think that everything in the universe is wholly physical. Yeah, see, right. this is something I wonder if they're going to talk about, because I don't like this. He's saying he's a materialist. He doesn't think everything is wholly physical. That's not true. <laughs> it's false. <laughs> I guess a lot depends on what you mean by physical, as we were talking a lot about the other day. Huh. Okay, so he's a materialist. What he really is is a monist. He thinks there's one type of stuff. That happens to be consciousness, but hey, whatever. It's one. Let's call that premise one. Premise two. Oh, well, consciousness Wait, hold on. Physical, couldn't be physical. Just the very idea, idea of what it is. Um, and the conclusion follows immediately. It doesn't exist. Uh, now... That's what you have to do. But okay, here's the, that's a bad argument. And what's wrong is the premise is, the second premise is, is wrong as far as I'm concerned. The premise that says consciousness could not be physical. So my argument would go. Yeah, but he agrees that consciousness couldn't be physical. <laughs> what is he talking about? Um, he's 100% claiming that consciousness is not physical because he's a panpsychist. He's really fighting hard to keep this word physical and apply it to panpsychism and i guess in moods i can see where he's going this is what i was talking about the other day i can see what he's doing but isn't this doing this isn't physicalism or materialism of any kind all right but anyway let's let him go like this instead everything materialism everything in the world is wholly physical step premise one premise two consciousness certainly exists there is nothing more certain than that consciousness exists Conclusion, consciousness is wholly physical. A next step, so the physical is, some, is not what we thought it was when we naturally thought that consciousness couldn't be physical. We've got to completely rethink 
what the physical is. So that's how I. Well, that, I don't really see that step in the argument. I know he's he has a, a a traditional way of making this point in terms of no emergence. Um, and so uh, maybe he will get to that at some point. Okay, interesting. But so I agree with the first two steps. Uh, everything is metaphysical. Consciousness certainly exists. Therefore, consciousness has to be identical to some structural or functional property. <laughs> or we have to radically redefine what we mean by physical. So I think you get a disjunction there. And not everyone thinks in accordance with Strassen that it's so hard to understand how consciousness could be physical. So interesting. Okay, so there's more to this and I definitely want to get to it, but uh, I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna have to get back to this in a second part. I wonder if you're gonna discuss all this stuff. Uh, we'll find out. <laughs>